Hello and welcome to today's lecture on tunable and dual band microstrip antenna. So, why do we need tunable microstrip antenna? Now, suppose let us say you have designed an antenna and the design frequency was suppose 1 gigahertz and after the design you have done the fabrication. Now, what you find is that instead of 1 gigahertz it may be 1.05 gigahertz or 0 0.95 gigahertz because your design should not be too much off also. In fact, if you design antennas using the simple design equations given by us in the earlier lecture, you should be able to get an antenna within plus minus 5 percent. But now suppose instead of 1, let us say we got 1.05 gigahertz. So, now there are multiple options are there. One is that you actually make another antenna and for the other antenna you need to choose the dimension. So, you can use the concept of F1 L1 equal to F2 L2. So, for example, whatever length you have taken for which you are getting 1.05. So, L1 into F1 which is 1.05 and the desired is 1. So, you put 1 there and L2. Find the new length and do another fabrication. And also if the feed point is not matched with the 50 ohm, then you need to shift the feed point also towards the edge or towards the center depending upon whether the impedance is low or impedance is high. But these things require multiple fabrication things and sometimes you want a quick fix solution. So, we are going to tell you today how even though you have fabricated the antenna which is not working properly or it has a slight shift in the resonance frequency or maybe slight shift in the impedance, how we can take care of that problem without fabricating another antenna. So, let us start with tunable microstrip antenna. So, we will first start with the tunable microstrip antenna and then we will talk about dual band. We will first see that what is the need of dual band antenna and then we will talk about dual band microstrip antenna. So, let us focus right now on tunable microstrip antenna. So, one of the simpler way to design a tunable rectangular microstrip antenna with this single stub. So, what we really have here, let us say this is the antenna which has been fabricated with the length of L width W and here is the feed point. And for this particular case now, you measured the frequency which is not really the desired frequency, it is slightly shifted either increase or decrease. So, now by adding a stub over here, we can actually reduce the frequency. I will tell you how to increase the frequency also. So, suppose we add a stub over in this direction and this stub can be simply added take a copper file and that copper file can be soldered over here and the rest of the thing you can use a something like a simple tape and tape it over there. So, let us say now this length which we have added and this width over here. So, strip has a width of W and length L. Now, this whole thing can be now approximated as that if you find the area of this which will be L into W, which is a small W. Now, this particular thing you now equate to the effective W over here. So, we can actually say if we say it is a effective W and think that effective length increase will be delta L1. So, we can say that delta L1 will be nothing but W effective multiplied by L effective which is the area of the stub. We always use effective length to account for the fringing field from the stub and that divided by W e which is the effective width of the microstrip patch. So, this gives us delta L 1. So, now we can find out the resonance frequency as same as before C divided by 2 L e, but now L e has this additional delta L 1 coming into picture that is because of this stub here. So, actually speaking now uh, let us say we got 1.05 gigahertz earlier and we want this to be 1. So, you put 1 here we know what is L effective find out what should be corresponding delta L 1 and then correspondingly then you can use finite length and width of the stub and this can be always cut or added little more to tune the frequency. Now, this also does one additional thing. So, now think about this now. So, effective length is increased on this side here. So, if it is effective length is increased on this side, then the 0 axis of the 
field will be slightly shifted on this side. So if the zero axis is shifted slightly on this side, so what will happen now? Input impedance will reduce. So you have to also check when you do the measurement, see what is the impedance you got. Suppose you got impedance of say 60 ohm. So if the effective width center is shifted to this side, that 60 will become say 50, 55 ohm. But suppose you got only about 40 or 45 ohm. Then what you do instead of adding stub on this side, you put a stub on this side over here. And when you put a stub on this side, now the center will be shifted along this here. So if the zero axis is shifted away, so impedance at this point will increase. Now suppose you got exactly 50 ohm or 55 ohm, which is a good matching. Then what you do? You add stub on both the directions. Okay. So now by adding a stub, what you really can achieve, you can reduce the resonance frequency. But what if the resonance frequency is already less and you want to increase it? So adding stub will not help. In that case, what you can do? You can actually cut a notch. So suppose now you cut a notch in this side. So what will happen now? Effective length will reduce and that will increase the frequency. So you can use the same concept either you cut a notch over here or you can cut a notch over here or you can cut notch on both the side and by doing that you can increase the resonance frequency. Now again cutting notch is very important where you cut it. So if you cut here resonance frequency will increase because the effective length is decreased. However, if you cut the notch only let us say in this direction. So if you cut notch here, if you recall compact microstrip antenna, then this configuration will look more like a C shaped microstrip antenna which is compact. So if you just cut a slot like this here, then effective length will be increasing. So that will reduce the frequency. And if you cut a notch here, let us say as well as you cut a notch here, then it will resemble something similar to H shaped microstrip antenna. And again the path length has increased, so resonance frequency will change accordingly. So you can cut notch appropriately with the smaller values, then you can tune the frequency either to the higher side or to the lower side. But now let us just see the numbers by adding this stub here how much change frequency really takes place. Okay. So let us just see the various values here. So here we have taken a case L equal to 3 centimeter, W as 4 centimeter, feed point has been fixed because once you do the experiment feed point will be fixed and these are the substrate parameters. So what in the table you see over here, this is the effect of the stub. Okay. So what we have done, we have taken a length of the stub of different values and even the width has been taken different value. So let us start with this. So if there is a no stub added, that means L is 0, W is 0, then in that case resonance frequency is 2.975 gigahertz and the bandwidth is about 65 megahertz. Now let us say this is not the desired frequency, you want to reduce it. So then if we add a stub of length 0.5, and width 0.4, you can see that the resonance frequency reduced from 2.975 to 2.898. If we increase the length further, we can see that the resonance frequency is reduced further. And here it shows the effect of the width also. So you can see that length is same, but the width is reduced by half. If the width is reduced by half, the area of the stub will reduce and hence delta L1 will reduce. So that is why 2.828, it increases back if you reduce this here. So really speaking, from 2.975, you can tune down to 2.74. If you see the variation here, that is about 230 megahertz. So that is close to about 8 percent. So by adding this term, you can tune the resonance frequency by almost 5 to 8 percent. But then something strange also happens. If we take this length, stub length equal to 1.5. Now just this 1.5 is approximately half of 3 centimeter. That means this length will be now lambda by 4. And if this length is lambda by 4, something else happens. 
Now what you can see here, instead of having a single resonance which we were getting, this resonance is split into two part. So there is a lower resonance here and there is a higher resonance here. So why that happens? So let us see if this length is equal to lambda by 4, we will go back to the figure. So if the length is lambda by 4, this is an open circuit. So open circuit will create a short at this particular point. So you can see that the boundary condition has changed significantly. Now at lower frequency, wavelength will be large and if the wavelength is large, then this length will be less than lambda by 4 and if this length is less than lambda by 4, it will act like a capacitive impedance over here. And if frequency is high, then this length will be slightly greater than lambda by 4, then this will offer a inductive load at this particular point. So now just recall for a rectangular microstrip antenna, we were looking at a Smith chart. So just imagine there is a Smith chart here. So resonance frequency is actually the lower resonance was here and as you keep the frequency, frequency is actually changing. So this is the inductive part and here it is capacitive part. So now at the lower frequency, this tub adds capacitance. So it was inductive earlier, you add a capacitance, so that becomes a resonance, comes close to the central axis. And when this particular thing at higher frequency, this offers an inductive load and on a Smith chart, the impedance curve would have been here, which would be impedance value. Now you are adding inductance to that, it will come back to the real axis. So you need to imagine all this figure here and that is why at L equal to lambda by 4, we actually see the split in the resonance frequencies and we actually get a dual band antenna. Now the only problem with this configuration is that the bandwidth at each of the band is relatively small compared to the bandwidth for the other rectangular patch or stub loaded patches here. So now let us just look at the another configuration. So we can see that by adding the stub or cutting notch, we can tune the frequency. Another way to do the tuning is by adding number of shorting pins. In fact, we did discuss about this configuration when we talked about compact microstrip antenna. And we had discussed that if this Ws divided by W is changed, then the resonance frequency changes because effective length changes. So let us just recheck again. Suppose the way it is shown here, if this is Ws, then from here to here, length will be lambda by 4. If it is fully shorted, then this length will be lambda by 4. If there is a single shot, then this entire length will be lambda by 4. And since the length is increasing, so what happens? Resonance frequency will decrease. So for these cases here, L equal to 1.2, W equal to 1.2, X fixed over here, epsilon r parameters are given here. So these are the normalized frequency values. Okay. So in fact, it is important to actually know what is the normalized value because the requirement may be different for different application. So it is good to see what happens, the normalized value here. So one can actually see if the width is fully shorted, if that is normalized to 1, then as partially shorting takes place, then we can see that the resonance frequency is changing. And by changing the width of this here, we can actually tune the frequency from 1 to 0 0.65. So here, generally speaking, what you do, you start with the lesser number of shorting posts and then you increase the number of shorting posts to get the desired exact frequency. Now, another way to do it is, so once you put the shorting post, that is fixed. You can't tune it any further. So there is another way also, instead of using a proper shorting post, you can actually put pin diodes here. So pin diodes are nothing but just to tell, normal diode has a PN junction, P and N. A pin diode has P, I, N. So these are the thing and generally P, I, N diodes are used at microwave frequency. So if these pin diodes are forward bias, they will act as a short circuit. And if the pin diodes are reverse biased, they will act as open circuit. So if you put number of pin diodes over here at number of places here, so by switching them off or on, we can vary the shorting position here and thereby we can do the tuning of the frequency. 
So, this is the one of the way you can tune the frequency. Instead of using pin diodes, we can also use another device which is known as a vector diode. What is a vector diode? Vector diode is again a diode, but its capacitance varies with the reverse bias voltage. So, let us see how we have put here in this particular figure. So, here is length and this is width here. The two vector diodes are shown over here. Now, just to tell you the biasing circuit is not shown over here. The vector diode has to be biased properly and a reverse bias voltage has to be given. So, these are the length, width and x values for this particular patch and the vector diode voltage just to tell you what we have here. So, this is the bias voltage and this is the frequency response. So, what we can notice here is just to mention this is a reverse bias voltage okay? and that is 0, 10, 20, 30. So, as the reverse bias voltage increases, we can see that the frequency is changing. But however, just to tell you what really a vector diode, if we look at the vector diode characteristic, the vector diode characteristic is actually reverse bias voltage here and for the vector diode, we normally show capacitance over here. So, if we have a capacitance here for vector diode, capacitance response is like this. Okay? So, higher value, it reduces to the lower value. So, now if the capacitance is lower here, think about the rectangular patch is nothing but equal to, if we can represent this as a parallel combination of R, L, C. So, if now C is changed or external capacitance is added, so, how is the resonance frequency defined? Omega 0 is 1 by square root L c and if the smaller capacitance is added or a large capacitance. So, if a large capacitance that is the capacitance characteristic, large capacitance is added, frequency will reduce. So, if you actually look at the characteristic of this, it is just reverse of the characteristic of a vector diode which is like this here. So, that means capacitance increases, resonance frequency reduces. So, by changing the bias voltage from 0 to 30 volt, what we can see that the resonance frequency changed from 1.4 to 1.81 gigahertz and that is a tuning range of about 25 percent. Now, see something like this, I just want to tell, this is not a broadband antenna. So, at a given value of the biasing voltage, there will be some frequency over here. The bandwidth of the antenna is relatively narrow, but this bandwidth is basically getting tuned. So, let us say if the biasing voltage is here, then the resonance frequency will be let us say around 1.7. Bandwidth will be still close to about say 2 percent or so. Now, the biasing voltage is changed, so it goes over here. Now, the biasing voltage is changed over here for example. Then it will be 1.6, but with the bandwidth of say approximately 2 percent. So, that is the way it is not a broadband antenna, it is a tunable antenna. Now, these kind of a things are actually required. For example, let us say we want to use a application for example, say ground penetrating radar. So, for a ground penetrating radar, let us say what we do, we send a signal down to the earth, it reflects back from whatever metallic portion or dielectric portion is there, it reflects back over here. So, generally if you use only one frequency, then one frequency goes back down there and comes back and you can measure the amplitude and phase of the reflected signal, but that is not sufficient to detect the buried object. So, the concept which has been used is stepped frequency radar okay, or stepped frequency FMCW radar. So, in that case what happens? You change the frequencies in steps. So, let us say you send one frequency measure the reflector, then you change the second frequency measure. So, now there are two options. One is we change the frequency which can be designed using varying the input of the VCO which is a voltage controlled oscillator. Now, there are two options. One is you use two broadband antenna or the other option is we can use two narrow band antenna, but they are tuned with frequency. So, as the VCO voltage changes, which changes the resonance frequency, that same VCO voltage can be modified and that can be used to tune the vector diode, which will change the frequency. So, this way you can realize a compact microstrip antenna, which can be tuned by changing the voltage 
and this change will be similar to that of the change in the VCO. So, many applications where we want to transmit a signal for a narrow bandwidth, but we want to tune that for a different frequency, this kind of a concept can be used very appropriately. So, now let us just go to the next configuration, which is a dual band rectangular microstrip antenna. Now, I just want to say there are several applications where we require dual band microstrip antenna. For example, an application can be where we transmit a signal at one frequency and we receive the signal at different frequency. So, here is the one configuration where we are using single feed. However, there are many times requirement where you use dual feed also, but let us just see one by one. So, the single feed, in fact, if you recall rectangular microstrip antenna, we did discuss something like this here, but let us just look into here. So, what we have here a length L which is 3 centimeter, this is the width which is 4 centimeter and now this feed point can be optimized corresponding to the length here and corresponding to the width. So, now it is fed at a diagonal. So, when the feed is along the diagonal, then what happens? It will excite both the modes, this one here also and this one here also. So, at lower frequency since W is large, so this mode will get excited and at higher frequency because L is small, this mode will get excited. So, you can actually see the VSWR plot here. So, there is a decent matching also. One frequency you can see is around 2.3 or so and another one you can see close to 3 giga. Now, these two frequencies correspond to the length and W. So, this frequency corresponds to length 3 centimeter and this one corresponds W equal to 4 centimeter. So, in fact, depending upon the design requirement. So, suppose we want this to be even lower than this value, you can increase W. If you want this to be increased, we can increase W here. But however, I just want to mention here, uh, this particular feed point actually gives orthogonal polarization. Why it gives orthogonal? Because when the length is excited at this particular frequency, that time the E field is this here. So, that would be the E plane. But at a lower frequency, when W is dominant, then in that case E plane is in this side. So, you can actually say that E plane is changing, polarization changes from this plane to this plane. So, if an application requires orthogonal polarization, one can be used for transmit and receive, then this is a good configuration. Now, as I mentioned, not always we want a single feed, sometimes we want dual feed also. So, here it is exactly the same example as before, except that now there are two feed points. So, we have taken the same dimension 3 centimeter, 4 centimeter, x, y are same, but now there are two feet 1 and 2. So, you can actually see the response, this response is almost similar to the previous case here. So, this response here corresponds to, you can see here dotted, that is S22. S22 is over here. So, this really corresponds to width W becoming resonant and this response which is actually S11 that corresponds to the length being resonant. But over here now one additional important thing is there. When there are two feeds, we would like to know what is the isolation between the two feeds. It is very, very important to have this isolation and just to refresh the memory. So, when we feed at this point, then this axis here will be a null axis. Okay? And when this is fed over here, then corresponding to this width, this acts as a null axis. So, you can see that for this feed, this is along null axis, for this feed, this is along null axis. So, that is why the isolation between them is fairly good. You can see the response which is S21 response. So, between 1 and 2 and S21 will be same as S12. So, that is same. So, over here you can see that the isolation is roughly better than about 24 dB across the entire band of 2.2 to 3, but that is not really too much of an interest. What is of interest is corresponding to this here, what is the isolation? 
So, if you see that in this particular range here, where let us say reflection coefficient is less than 10, if you see over here, that is almost 27, 28 dB is the isolation. Whereas, we are getting a much better isolation in this particular band, if you see corresponding to minus 10 dB, if you draw here, so this value is somewhere less than 35 dB. So, we are getting a very good isolation in this particular situation. So, here now what the problem is again that for this frequency the polarization will be in this plane, E plane polarization and for this feed point polarization will be in this plane. So, that means there will be two orthogonal polarization. So, in the next lecture we will actually look into uh, how to design same polarization for the same feed point. So, that means for a given feed point let us say if this is the feed point we we'll look at an alternate configuration where at both the band polarization will be same. So, just to recap, so today we talked about tunable microstrip antenna, we looked at different techniques. So, one technique was we can add a stub to do the frequency tuning or we can cut a notch and the stub and notch can be also cut carefully, so that you can do little bit of a impedance variation also for proper impedance matching. Then we also saw that we can do the tuning by adding shorting posts or instead of that we can use pin diode. Then alternate technique we looked at it is a vector diode by changing the reverse bias voltage of a vector diode, we can tune the frequency by almost 25 percent. And then we looked at the dual band orthogonal polarization, okay. but in the next lecture now we will also see dual band for the same polarization. So, thank you very much. We will see you in the next lecture. Bye.